So um, we're kind of going to go back to state tomography, and we're going to kind of uh, talk about learning beyond Clifford's states and circuits. This is a uh, joint work with uh, Sweeney Boston, um, Sergey Bravi, Ted Yoder at IBM Research um, about this paper, Optimal Algorithms for Learning Quantum Phase States. I'll also be uh, talking about the learning quantum circuits of some T-gates, a paper by um, Lei and Cheng. So our motivation basically comes from quantum state tomography, where you have access to multiple copies of an unknown n qubit quantum state row, and you want to learn row by performing measurements on these copies. And these measurements might be, you know, separable measurements or even entangled measurements. And we already know that there's some kind of natural applications of quantum state tomography to calibration, certificate verification, quantum sensing. And as we have seen multiple times now, the sample complexity or the number of copies that you kind of need to actually learn this uh, state you typically grows exponentially with uh, n. So kind of what we'll ponder in, throughout this talk is what are classes of n-qubit quantum states that you can be learned efficiently. And we know some examples um, such as stabilizer states, uh, matrix product states, uh, or even high temperature Gibbs states of local Hamiltonians. And I'll kind of in the very beginning just uh, talk more about stabilizer states and see how we can extend from there. So we're going to actually start off with a subclass of stabilizer states called graph states. And these are pretty cool states because they kind of take a compact description on a graph. So here I'm denoting the nodes or the vertices by V and the edges by E. So I have a five qubit graph. Uh, so here are all the nodes correspond to the qubits, all initialized in the plus state. And I'm going to have like two qubit operations in the future, um, all denoted by these U operators. So suppose I took these U operators to be just control Z operators between those any two adjusting qubits then this would be kind of what my state will look like. And if I wanted to kind of look at the corresponding quantum circuit, what I'll have is just all the zeros on the five qubits. I would apply a Hadamard transform to take them to the all plus state, and then I'll put control Zs wherever there is an edge between two qubits. And I'll just do a quick rundown of the circuit because as it turns out, we'll see some kind of phase description popping out. So initially we have the all zero state, apply the Hadamard transform, we get an equidistribution over all the five bit binary strings. And now we have ahead of us a bunch of controlled Z uh, gates. So if you were to look at the action of any controlled Z on a n bit binary string, it kind of imparts this phase of minus one power xi xj. So now if we just do a rundown of the entire circuit, then we get kind of this phase information where now we have this uh, quadratic polynomial terms, so a bunch of quadratic monomial terms that kind of correspond to the different uh, gates that we had applied. So first thing off, you'll notice that there's quadratic. It's also there's monomial to gate correspondence. And how do you learn these graph states? Uh, so I'll just write this n qubit graph state now a bit more generally, where now I have the phase uh, with the power of f of x, where f is some Boolean function. In this case, it's quadratic, so I'll just denote as x transpose ax where A is the adjacency matrix of the graph that we had earlier. Now we know to how to actually learn these graph states efficiently. Um, this was introduced by Rothler in 2010 and extended by Montana in 2017 um, by a procedure they call Bell sampling. And the idea is you just measure in the Bell basis. So you start off to, with two copies of uh, Psi F, where then you apply a C naught between each qubit in the first copy of Psi F with the target in the, sec in the second copy. So you'll have like a C naught gate between the first qubit in the first copy and the target in the first qubit of the second copy and so on. And then you apply Hadamard transform on the first uh, copy. And if you were to then measure just in the computational basis, in the second register you get just uniformly random n bit binary string. And in the first register you get actually what is a derivative in the z direction. And they showed that you just need order of n samples to learn these graph states. And what you're really doing is just learning the stabilizers that stabilize the stabilizer state. Now, this is an example of a classically simulatable state that is efficiently learnable. We all know that you know, Clifford circuits producing these stabilizer states are efficiently learnable. And the question that we'll kind of now look at is, can we learn states efficiently that are also hard to simulate classically? So I'll just take this example that we've discussed so far, and I'll just pop in these uh, two um, gates, the Z gate and this control control Z gate. So as before, I'll just do a rundown of the circuit, and now I have an action of Z, just imparts a phase of minus one, on the xi, where if the i of the qubit is where the z is acting, if an action of control control z, then I'll just get a, now a third monomial, a cubic monomial term in the phase. If I do a rundown of the entire circuit, so now I introduce uh, these monomials of like x2 and then x2, x3, x4. So 
as before, now I see like, you know, I have a cubic um, polynomial. And again, as before, I have mono monomial to get correspondence. In fact, this is what kind of uh, learning these states will actually let us learn these circuits as well later. What I've showed you so far is actually um, belongs to a subclass of IQP circuits, where you have start off with a bunch of Hadamards, and then you have a bunch of internal gates, which are only allowed to be Z control Z and control control Z. And the reason why this is we're interested in this is that it was shown um, by Bremner and others in 2011 that these are actually hard to simulate classically. So now can we learn these states efficiently? And moreover, we'll kind of be interested in what we'll call as binary quantum phase states, where not only do we just let them be Z, C, Z, C, Z, Z, we can just have these controls over like maybe D, D qubits. And then the phase state description, again, we'll have a phase of F of X on like power minus one. Now, but F will be a degree D Boolean polynomial which we now can write compactly, where j is a subset of the n qubits over which you have a monomial term, and alpha j are the coefficients, which are you know, either zero or one. And we have seen some examples of these. So this is one extension of um, like looking beyond stabilizer states, where we, in fact, the graph states, and where we use the quadratic binary phase state picture. The second thing that we know of that stabilizer states is that they have a compact description even in terms of the stabilizer group. So it's a joint eigenvector of like a billion subgroup, and we'll think of now extending this to something called stabilizer pseudo mixture. And we'll see later in the talk that these are um, kind of produced by Clifford circuits with some T gates, in particular, just one layer of T gates. And uh, we'll call such states on all the zero state as a T depth one state. And these will turn out, we'll see later characterization that these can be written down as a linear combination of stabilizer states. So the rest of the talk, I'll kind of talk about how to learn these uh, two types of states. In both cases, what we'll do is just exploit the structure for learning. So kind of to give you um, what the, the results that we have, in the, for the first part of the talk, so we have extended some results for Bernstein Vazirani, where they talked about learning degree one states, Monter and Rottler for degree two states, to the case now of learning any F2 degree D. And we can do this in order of n power D samples if we have separable measurements, and order of n power D minus samples if we have entangled measurements. And in fact, uh, we can also look at generalized phase states, where instead of having a you know a real fa uh, minus one, we can ha have look at like complex phases, and these produ are produced by like diagonal unitaries of the Clifford hierarchy, and we can also learn these in polynomial sample complexity. But for this talk, I'll just focus on the binary phase states case, and in the second part, um, I'll just look at learning the t depth one states and t depth one circuits. All right, so now. Back to like learning binary phase states. Uh, the first question we want to ask is, can we learn these from random samples? And this is kind of motivated from like the Boolean, like classical learning literature on Boolean functions, where the typical the learning model is that you have access to random samples of x comma f of x, where x is some n bit binary string. And how do you learn f in this case? So suppose you have m samples where like x is some maybe random n bit binary string, and f of x is just the evaluation on it. So typically you create a linear system of equations. So here, uh, on the left-hand side, this big matrix, what I have, each column corresponds to different monomials that might be there in our uh, polynomial. So monomials of form 1, x1, x1, x2, and so on. And the different rows correspond to the different samples that you have. So the elements are essentially evaluations of these monomials under these uh, samples. And now this is the coefficient of vec um, basically a vector of coefficients in the function that you want to actually learn, and these are the function evaluations. So kind of the number of monomials that are kind of present, or the number of columns in this matrix, is if you were to look at, if you were to fix k, the degree of the monomial that you're allowing, then there's like n choose k possibilities. So yeah, I'll just denote this in the form of n less than or equal to d, where d is the maximum degree, and then these are the, like, the sizes of the two different, like the system. And then um, you can see any like, classical literature, for instance, Donald 2012, where they show that you need order of n power d random samples to learn this degree d Boolean function. So could we, for instance, do something of this sort? So can we get access to such random samples for uh, maybe quantum phase states? And it turns out this is pretty hard to um, extract, but maybe we can do something like what Bell sampling did, where we had access to these derivatives, so a derivative in some random direction. But it turns out this um, kind of method doesn't work for d greater than two. And mainly it's because, unfortunately, here there are like two power n random directions uh, that will be chosen by this derivative gadget. And getting any two copies in the same direction is kind of exponentially unlikely. 
So uh, I'll kind of talk about in the very beginning of how we can get access to some particular type of random samples. And I'll kind of focus on learning using just separable measurements. So here I just am applying maybe a P of M on one copy uh, sequentially. So we're just measuring the copy sequentially. And the routine that we call is a random partial derivative sampling. And the idea is that suppose you have an n bit, um, sorry, n qubit um, phase state. So now I'm going to measure all of the states but the kth qubit in the z basis. And whatever um, string I get, n minus one bit binary string will be uniformly random and I'll just denote it by y. And if I were look at, to look at the post measurement uh, state, then this is like a superposition of the zero plus one with an additional phase here of minus one f of zero y. So here I'm just kind of concatenating zero and y or and the uh, minus one f of one y. And this is equal to uh, the plus state if f of zero y and f of one y are of same value and negative if they are of different values. So all we need to do is kind of measure the kth qubit in the x basis and then we get access to the kth partial derivative evaluated at y. So it's kind of pretty simple. All you have to do is measure in the z basis everywhere except for the kth qubit where you measure in the x basis. And then you get access to random examples of the form of y where it's n minus one bit binary string and the partial derivative in the kth direction evaluated on it. As before, we saw that you, know, you can learn order any degree d Boolean polynomial in order of n power d samples. Here we're gonna learn degree d minus one derivatives and we just need order of n power d minus one samples to do this. So if we want to learn the function f, we just need to learn all the different derivatives, partial derivatives and directions, and we can just do that in order of n power d samples. So it's a very simple routine. So now, can we do better? Uh, perha perhaps using entangled measurements. So now we can measure all copies uh, together. So we'll kind of consider the pretty good measurements, which is kind of popular in quantum state identification. And the idea is that you have an ensemble of uh, different quantum states um, for OI, which you can select with probability PI. And the goal is to identify a state pulled from this particular uh, ensemble or distribution. And typically the POVM elements corresponding to pretty good measurements look something of this sort, where now the sigma is kind of like a weighted mixture of these uh, ensemble members. Now what pretty good measurements guarantees is that the success probability, which I'm denoting here by this, is not as good as the optimal success probability, if you chose uh, some crazy M, out M outcome P of M, but is at least uh, better than that to the second power. So now if you wanted to learn uh, these states using pretty good measurements, we could perhaps use uh, this theorem by Heron Winter, who showed that if you have uh, a bunch M ensemble members and F is your maximum fidelity uh, of all the different members in the ensemble, then you can identify any state with probability greater than one minus delta, provided that you have enough number of copies going as log of M over delta divided by a log of one over the fidelity. So this seems pretty cool, but unfortunately this is not strong enough for us because uh, what we're working with is a pretty large set. So here we have like exponential of order of N par D elements in our ensemble and some of them turn out to be very close together. So for instance, I can con consider a function f of x, and I'll just consider g of x, where to f of x I add this monomial, degree d monomial, and if I were to evaluate the inner product, which corresponds to the fidelity, it goes as one minus one over two power d minus one. So it's basically upper bounded by one, which is kind of bad for us. So, um, but it turns out that there is an average case theorem where instead of having the maximum fidelity being upper bounded, all you need to show is that the average fidelity over all of your ensemble members is upper bounded. And this actually allows us to um, show pretty good measurements succeeds in this case. So in our case, we just have to evaluate uh, this fidelity. And in the case of Boolean functions, this relates to this quantity. So here we're summing over all the functions in the ensemble. Um, and we're looking at this one minus two times the probability that f of x equal to b1, where x is now uniformly sampled from zero, one, n. And you can show that this is less than or equal to some small number, provided that n is some large uh, order, goes as order of n power d minus one uh, samples. And the way we do this is we kind of use known results on weight enumerators of read Muller codes. So in the interest of time, I'll kind of uh, skip why this is optimal and learning subclass of IQP circuits, but skip over to learning states and circuits of Clifford circuits uh, with some T gates.
So in the beginning, I'll kind of focus on how these can be shown to be a pseudo mixture of stabilizers and how you can learn these corresponding states. So uh, the reason we kind of thought of looking at Clifford circuits with T gates, well, obviously it's a universal gate set and you can have any unit entry that can be well approximated by Cliffords and T gates. So for instance, you can have a Clifford circuit in the very beginning followed by a layer of T gates and a Clifford circuit and so on. In our case, we're just going to look at T depth one quantum circuits. So we just have a one single layer of T gates. And it turns out that if you have a T depth one, um, so we're gonna also call this on the all zero state, just a T depth one quantum state. And if you have KT gates, you can actually write this down as a linear combination of stabilizer states. Uh, so here the, in the density matrix formulation, this is, these phi j's are just different stabilizer state components. And the coefficients alpha j all sum up to one. We call it a pseudo mixture because some of them turn out to be um, negative. So I'll just do the characterization slightly quickly um, of why you actually can write them down as a pseudo mixture. So you actually need the notion of a polyframe, which is kind of used, also called tabular representation and used in a uh, simulation. So here I'll just do, denote PN as the poly group. So it's the n-fold product over the single qubit poly operators uh, with some coefficients. Then you can write any uh, G in the poly group as C times, which is a coefficient, times Z power W, where W now is an n-bit binary string. And if it's zero, you basically put an identity on that qubit. If it's a one, then you put a Z on that uh, qubit. So then your tabular representation or the set of polys can be written down in this form. So the first column just con corresponds to the sign of all the Cs, and then you have all the n-bit binary strings correspond to Z, and then you have all the n-bit binary strings complete W, sorry, X. And the reason why polyframes are kind of powerful is that it allows you to track evolution of stabilizer states through Clifford circuits efficiently, and we know this from the gottesman neal theorem. So uh, what we have is actually a Clifford circuit with some T gates, so how do we actually convert it into just a purely Clifford circuit? What we do is we inject T gadgets into these T depth one uh, quantum circuits. And this basically gives us Clifford circuits, but now we have additional ancillaries with a plus T um, state. And you can actually show that these are equivalent to post-selected T gadgets if you have post-selection available to you. So what we'll now do is we'll take the quantum circuit that we had before with these uh, T gates, and now we can just inject these T gadgets so we just now introduce um, the equivalent number of ancillary states of plus T, and the rest of it is just a Clifford circuit. So here, again, in the interest of time, I'll skip over this, but basically you get three power K uh, stabilizer states because uh, it turns out there are three power K polyframes to be evolved. Um, but there's also more efficient characterization if you just look at how these um, polys get transformed again, under any T state. And in that case, you can actually write down these um, T depth one quantum states, even though they're a pseudo mixture of like three power K stabilizer states, instead of using like order of N stabilizers for each component and having an order of three power K N description, you can actually look at just N, N plus M stabilizers that they all share. And in this case, N plus M of them, in fact, actually can be separated into two sets where N minus M of them are actually isotropic. So they stabilize all the components and you have two M, M primary symplectic stabilizers. And by symplectic, I mean they kind of s satisfy these anti-commutation relationships. So how do you actually learn these N plus K M stabilizers in the pseudo mixture of this unknown T depth one quantum state? It turns out that you can just do Bell sampling on these and you get access uh, to these um, polys that basically stabilize at least one of the components in your uh, pseudo mixture. In fact, you can show that you need to just do Bell sampling on order of n copies, and this will give you all the n plus k stabilizers of uh, the quantum state. The issue is that to get the full description, you still actually need to separate them out into n minus k isotropic stabilizers and 2k uh, symplectic uh, partners, and this is kind of hard to do just by brute force. But instead, what one can do is just do poly measurements on order of three power k n stabilizers to figure out the measurement, uh, to figure out when, how you assign the different coefficients. So the sample complexity goes as order of three power k n, so this is only efficient for log n. And in that case, if you have log n t gates, it's actually classically simulatable. So it's not an example of where something is hard to simulate classically. Um, but, and you can basically use the same idea for learning uh, these T depth one quantum states by just, sorry, T depth one circuits by learning the equivalent T depth one states. I'll just rush to the summary. 
So we kind of saw that you can learn these degree d binary phase states in order of n power d separable measurements, in order of n power d minus entangled measurements. But moreover, we kind of saw that you know there are subclass of IQP circuits that are hard to simulate, but their corresponding states and circuits are actually easy to learn. Things that we were kind of thinking about are mainly about improving the time complexity and how if these circuits get more complicated, how, could you still learn these more efficiently? Thank you, and I'll take questions. So uh, I just worked out the forward problem for you. So there I'm just showing how you would actually simulate such a quantum circuit where the T-gates are placed. But in fact, you don't need to know the locations of the T-gates. Uh, when you're solving the inverse problem where you're just trying to learn these circuits, uh, what's important um, is that you know that there's at most order of 2n, um, so like stabilizers, that you actually need to learn because k could be at most n. Um, and that's enough. It's a simple one. The, the, the k is, is the, the number of t gates on a layer. Yep. The number of t gates on a layer. You know, just try to shout. Sorry, but this is uh, any notion of robustness. So don't ask the kids. Like, I mean, if I you know, give you a sample, it's just approximated by. That's a good question. So in the case of the learning quantum phase states, it actually turns out to be robust to readout error. But suppose you had like some kind of quantum noise on the uh, gates themselves, then the protocol that I've described is actually not robust. You can show easily even for the state, like just consider the stabilizer states, so the quadratic phase states. Uh, even Bell sampling is not robust, for instance. And if you have like some kind of depolarizing noise, if it's like local depolarizing noise and not global depolarizing noise, then you, in fact, through bell sampling, you need actually um, kind of exponential sample complexity. Uh, can you do structured learning on a parameter for learning? So, yeah. So the question was, can you learn um, parameterized? So learning uh, parameterized uh, quantum circuits. So in that case, we would need to take this following structure, though. So um, here, the rotations that you could, for instance, allow on these control Zs are limited. The, um, they are limited to just multiples of pi over 4. So it's a very limited parameterization for which you could show optimality. Does this technique generalize to uh, pinpoint the number of pi like, does, what are the restrictions on it? Does it have to be just a single qubit injectable state? Or does it have to be, could it be in multi-qubit injectable states? Does it have any restrictions on multiple Yeah, so the second part of the talk where I just focus on, on T-gates, um, that there it's actually important that it's just T-gates. It's kind of, um, is mainly ascribed to that. In the first part of the talk, I didn't talk about these generalized quantum phase states, but these uh, can be used to learn any diagonal unitary of the Clifford hierarchy or states produced by those, and those includes uh, T-gates, for instance. Um, so those could be also like multiple qubit uh, diagonal unitaries that you could have. And then you can also get, uh, depending on what is the level of the Clifford hierarchy you're working with, uh, so if you're working with the dth level of the Clifford hierarchy, you actually need order of n power d separable measurements to learn those states. Yeah, so um, I didn't have time to get into that, but mainly the fact is that these T gates introduce basically a linear combination of these polys uh, when they act on them. And these polys have this additional relationship of being symplectic partners. So even though here you have actually two possible ways of writing down the linear combination, you see like X and Y are repeated up to a phase. And these are like symplectic partners. That means that they satisfy some anti-commutation relationship. And uh, this kind of is vital. 
And this is also kind of preserved under the Clifford circuits. So, but if you had another layer of T gates later, this again wouldn't be preserved. So again, this is very um, precisely only for one layer of T gates. Uh, is that going to be a fast question or? Okay. Uh, no. All you need to know is, well, we already know there's only at most 10. Um, I just work in the forward problem, knowing the number of T gates, just to kind of show it. But you don't. Okay, so that will be the last question. Um, but I also have one more announcement from the organizers, which is that a poster session begins at 7 p.m. in the UFO, which is the large auditorium uh, that the plenary talks were held in. And you should bring your vote token. And also, there will not be any food provided, so bring your drink tickets. <laughs>